to welcome everyone into the Tewa world, uh, the place that uh, we're going to be talking about, uh, the place where we're grounded, and um, the time that we were born into as a uh, very sacred place uh, that needs to be um, looked at in a uh, manner, that manner being of the indigenous people who were planted here, um, our belief by creator and um, to begin, uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, the Tewa world uh, being our church and uh, why we believe that um, it is our church and uh, a manner in which uh, to open up uh, what our intentions are for, for today. And as uh, indigenous people uh, from this area, we have uh, ancestral prayers that have been passed down for generations and generations and, and hundreds of years. And uh, these uh, territorial uh, points may you, uh, are uh, vital into the territory in which our Tewa people were, were planted. And uh, to the north, is uh, Sashu Ping, to the west, Tsikumi Ping, to the south, Oku Ping, and to the east, Kuse Ping. Our belief is that we were planted here as uh, the caretakers of creator's gifts of the air, the water, the land, and each other. And there were instructions that were learned and given and mannerisms in how to carry, go forth as the caretakers of, of this place. And um, it was said that if we don't take care of those gifts, that it's not going to take care of us. With the manner of our ancestors who knew how to live in peace and harmony. I wish at this time to invite them in to join us, uh, to witness, and to guide us in help us learn the mannerism of living in peace and harmony. So with your permission, Ubi Indi. Jia ing, Dara ing, Koo ing, Kii, Kaje, Motu ing, Papa, Papa Jia, Serovi e, Kujovi e, Posejemo. คุณดาวอันนั้นทําไปเมื่อวิถีนี้แม่กินดีให้แก่นั้นที่วันนี้ฉันได้กูดีให้เห็นนะวิถีวะดีให้ดาวเวเฮอันนี้นวิถีวะ
And this happened when a uh, European came and then it was incorporated to our United States uh, Supreme Court, uh, the whole doctrine of discovery and uh, which uh, we really need to look at that should be null and void in our time in order for us to uh, live in peace and harmony and go forward. Uh, the other uh, paper that was written um, by the United States government uh, to continue this warlike manner of destruction was uh, the um, Forest Powers Act that gave themselves permission to come to our West Wall and plant themselves in uh, our sacred mountain uh, to uh, do the opposite of everything that we were ever taught about for life, things that are life-giving, how to destroy a, uh, a, an earth <laughs> with the division of that one atom you know, these were uh, very sacred knowledges and anything sacred is to be left alone and, uh, and honored because of the, uh, the powers that they uh, inherited and acknowledge it. Um, but that's not the case, you know, these things were, were uh, messed with and played with and now um, we're in a very hard predicament on how we fix it. Uh, this cannot happen unless we as uh, human beings, uh, being spirit people and human people, um, use our minds and our hearts to uh, be on the same page of, uh, of uh, the unseen of spirituality. Uh, to overcome all that is uh, destructive. So it's, uh, you know, with a, a heavy heart, but with a loving heart uh, to humbly be here this morning to uh, have the opportunity to, to speak um, what I'm feeling and uh, and when we feed energy, it's what comes out from, from our spiritual self to, to the universe. And it's so important that we know that everyone has an indigenous root somewhere, everybody. And everybody comes from a spiritual place of peace and harmony. Everyone we're given these instructions, it's in our DNA. You know, we need to be mindful to tell our young people, um, be careful on how you make your money. Everyone is given gifts. We need to know what, learn what our gifts are and uh, develop them and those are the things that take care of each one of us because that's what we have to offer. Where uh, even working, you know, at this uh, laboratory, where you can't even go home and talk about uh, what you did at, at your day, you know, with your family at the dinner table. Um, what's wrong with that picture? Or um, all these religious entities. Uh, churches and all that are built and working there and uh, what's wrong with these pictures, you know, that we're not living or walking the talk. With that, um, I'm hoping that uh, our ancestors who were given the instructions of living in peace and harmony will remain within our essence uh, throughout this day of presentation and, and that we're reminded that we are here in the Tewa world. It is our church. Our belief is that we are not owners of land. We're part of the land. 
ikut dawah. My name is Tina Cordova, and I'm the co-founder of the Tularosa Basin Downwinders Consortium, or TBDC for short. We're an, organi an organization that was founded 15 years ago by the late Fred Tyler of Tularosa and myself to bring attention to the negative health effects suffered by the people of New Mexico as a result of their overexposure to radiation after the Trinity test that took place July 16, 1945, a full 75 years ago in the desert of South Central New Mexico. Now, the government didn't warn people before or afterwards, and there was significant fallout. I want to talk specifically about the things that were unique to the Trinity test that made it so devastating to human health. And I want to talk about the lifestyles of the people in 1945 that also contributed to that. So first of all, the Trinity test was the only time that they detonated a bomb on a platform 100 feet off the ground. They never did that again. And as a matter of fact, what they learned at Trinity is that they produced, produced massive fallout. And their goal with this bomb was to produce massive destruction. And so when they went to Japan, they actually detonated the bombs there at heights of 1,600 and 1,800 feet, respectively. So the bomb was placed on a platform 100 feet off the ground. The impact of the bomb came down, intercepted the earth, had nowhere to go took up a large amount of dirt, sand, animal and plant life, incinerated it because it created more light and more heat than the sun, and then developed into a fireball that rose past the atmosphere into the stratosphere. Obviously, everything that goes up in that fashion has to come down. And it came down depending on the, the stratification of the winds, et cetera, during that time. July would have been our rainy season, our monsoon season in New Mexico, and the weather was very unsettled. Uh, as a matter of fact, the bomb, the detonation of the bomb was postponed from 4 in the morning till 5.29 a.m. in the morning when they actually had a break in the thunderstorms and showers that were in the area. So this ash fell from the sky for days afterwards and literally got on everything, everything, all the, everything, the, the, the earth, the animals, the plants, the human being in the area. Now, the bomb was very inefficient. The bomb was packed with 13 pounds of weapons grade plutonium, but only three pounds were necessary for the fission process. That meant that a full 10 pounds of weapons grade plutonium, the most toxic substance known to man, went up in that fireball and was dispersed across the Tularosa Basin. That plutonium has a half life of 24,000 years and likely remains as I said, dispersed all across the Tularosa Basin. Um, and so we now know that we have this bomb that created an enormous amount of fallout and also that it was incredibly ancient and that a lot of plutonium was dispersed as part of the explosion. You only have to inhale or ingest one particle of plutonium and it remains in your body, emitting radiation, damaging cells, damaging your organs for the remainder of your life. Uh, the other thing that's important to, to note about 1945 in the little villages, towns that surrounded Trinity is that people lived very organic lifestyles. And what that meant is that everything they ate, they actually produced, gathered, or hunted themselves. So everybody had a garden and everybody had an orchard. People had milk cows and goats for the purpose of milk, and they raised chickens and pigs and sheep and cattle, uh, all for the purpose of feeding themselves. And the reason for that is because there were no grocery stores. In 1945, there was no refrigeration. And so you couldn't go to a grocery store and buy dairy or produce or meat. You had to produce those things yourself. In July, it would have been the height of the harvest, and women would have been taking everything they could out of their gardens and their orchards and canning it for the upcoming winter. They would have been drying things uh, and doing all they could to preserve for the winter that was coming. Uh, there was also local dairies in all of these towns. And so uh, obviously the cows would have been exposed to radiation and then, and then obviously transmitting that in the milk that they produced. Uh, the other thing is that we had no running water. So the source of our water was the rain that fell from the sky. 
And again, July, our rainy season, people would have been filling up their cisterns. Lakes would have been filling up rivers, ditches. The little town I come from, Tularosa, has the largest ditch system in all of New Mexico. When they founded Tularosa over 150 years ago, the very first thing that they did was set up a ditch system. They knew that access to water year round was crucial to them being able to produce food and sustain their lives, their livelihoods. And so um, they counted on the water that flowed in the creeks in the area uh, to sustain them. And all of their cisterns, the, the holding ponds, the ditches, the, the rivers, the lakes, would now be contaminated by the ash that fell and got into their waterways. And so people were incredibly overexposed to radiation and no one knew. The other thing that's happened throughout the history of this for 75 years is that the government has controlled the messaging around what happened. And they always have described that area as remote and uninhabited. But we know, <clears throat> per the census, that there were tens of thousands of people living in a 50 mile radius and if you extend that radius to 150 miles, which the government admitted after the test, they could never do this again here because they so overexposed people to radiation. And if they ever did it again any place, they would have to find an area with a 150 mile radius uninhabited. Well, if you draw a radius around Trinity 150 miles, it extends past Albuquerque to the north, past Silver City to the west, past Artesia to the east, and past El Paso to the south. Now we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people. We recently found out that there was a spike in infant mortality in New Mexico after the Trinity test. After a 10-year decline in infant mortality in New Mexico, that coincides with the advent of antibiotics and uh, better, you know, medicinal, better medicines, better practices, medical practices, better hygienic practices. We had a 10 year decline in infant mortality, but in those months right after Trinity, we saw a spike in infant mortality. And so now I tell people we had casualties as a result of the Trinity test and they were our babies. And when the Manhattan Project was consulted about this by healthcare workers out of Roswell, who said our babies are dying, and we don't know why we can't keep them alive, and we hear it's worse in Alamogordo. And they said, please, uh, you know, let us know if there's something we should know about. And the Manhattan Project basically decided to deny that the data uh, showed that this was true and also deny that they knew about anything that might have contributed to this. And that is just unconscionable. We had casualties, they were our babies, and everybody, everybody should find that unforgivable. The other thing that's happened recently is that Dr. Joseph Shanka, a renowned health physicist and nuclear engineer, has developed a lecture about Trinity and what a dirty bomb it was. And Dr. Shanka has actually gathered information on a 10-year project that he spent 10 years on. It's called the Los Alamos Historic Document Retrieval and Assessment. He gathered that data and all he knew about Trinity and extrapolated knowing what we know about blasts of that kind and has said that people in New Mexico were exposed to 100 times more radiation than anybody ever was as a result of Nevada and likely 10 to 100 times more radiation than anyone ever was exposed to as, a, as the result of any nuclear incident anywhere in the world, including Chernobyl and Fukushima. So that brings me to the last point. There was a fund set up in 1990. It's called the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act. That fund was set up to take care of downwinders of the Nevada test site. And the people of New Mexico have never been included. Although we were the first people exposed to radiation as a result of Trinity, and although we are very well documented downwind from the Nevada test site as well, the compensation ends right at the New Mexico-Arizona border. And I always say as if there was a lead curtain there that offered us protection. The truth is we should have been included in that fund 30 years for the last 30 years and we have not. Our ultimate goal is to bring back compensation and healthcare coverage to the people of New Mexico who, hope, who so desperately need that. And so my last my last uh, part of this presentation is to appeal to all of you to reach out to your members of Congress, those in New Mexico and those from all across the country, and ask them to support House Bill 3783 and Senate Bill 947, 3783 and Senate Bill 947.
I appreciate this opportunity that's been given to me by Veterans for Peace, and I wish everybody well in this 75th year of the atomic age. Thank you so much. I wanna thank Veterans for Peace for inviting the TBDC to participate in this, in this forum. And I appreciate the support we've always received from them in the past. And it's been uh, an honor and a pleasure to work side by side with them. And I'm just going to issue an appeal to everybody who's watching uh, this forum and participating in some fashion to please, please, please reach out to your members of Congress and let them know that you support House Bill 3783 and Senate Bill 947, most specifically the House Bill that we believe goes far enough. And we're hoping that eventually the Senate Bill will be brought into, uh, into, into coinciding with the House Bill. Um, and you can ask your members of Congress to become co-sponsors of these bills. The bills by, have bipartisan support, but they've been stalled in Congress for 10 years. So we believe it's high time for Congress to move these bills forward to passage. And again, we just appreciate this opportunity and we look forward to working with everybody in the future. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. My name is Toshia Morita. I'm so happy to be with you through the internet. I'm a journalist in Kyoto and the board member of the Association of Second and Third Generation Hibakushi in Kyoto. My father was a survivor of an atomic bomb in Hiroshima. However, the Japanese government does not recognize him as a Hibakusha. I think he was on the border between Hibakusha and no Hibakusha. My mother was a survivor of the great Tokyo air light in World War II. So I hate wars, especially nuclear weapons. And also I hate nuclear power plants. Today, I'd like to argue how the damage of radiation have been suppressed since the time of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in order for the world authorities to continue its nuclear projects. Now, I explain how the US has the actual scale of damage from radiation. First, they limited the damage only from the initial radiation. The initial radiation means the direct radiation exposure as the time of bomb explosion. It is mainly composed of neutron and gamma ray, and the exposure from outside of the bodies. It only considered external exposure. The radiation people were exposed from outside of their bodies in the short time of bomb explosion. The US said that only those people who were inside of two kilometers radius at the time of bomb explosion were affected by radiation. In reality, people in much wider area were exposed to radiation. The mushroom cloud was full of radioactive materials and the radioactive fallout, including black rain, made more people in dozens of kilometers radius exposed to radiation, especially by internal exposure. This internal exposure made much more people suffer for much longer term. People in larger area inhaled, drank, or ate radioactive materials, and they were exposed to radiation from inside of their body. This internal radioactive exposure caused serious problems to human bodies, and they stay in their body long term. However, the US ignored such damage from the internal exposure. Since then, the US has developed the lady action protection and nuclear science based on their controlled data of Hibakusha, which ignore the impact of internal radioactive exposure. I think 
the same trick was used around the Trinity site or a low, low place. So we are all hidden Avon survivors. Uh, this photo is, uh, uh, this is a gathering of survivors in Alamo Road, uh, July 2019. Uh, 19. Uh, I joined uh, this visit. I was very, very moved. And I, I would love to tell you the new things. Now we have made great strides. This is an NHK News uh, 20, uh, 2020, uh, July uh, 29. People exposed to post bomb black line wing case. As the same court has recognized, for the first time, people a total of 84 plaintiffs who were exposed to radioactive rain immediately after the atomic bombing of Hiroshima in 1955 as hibakusha of the surface of the bombing. On Wednesday, July uh, 29, as the Hiroshima District Court uh, Presiding judge described the plaintiff's testimony as a reasonable. He says their health records show their developed illnesses is believed to be linked to the fallout from the atomic bombing, which makes them eligible for Hibakusha uh, certificates. Win. Union is strength. Let's work on the road to peace. I would like to give you my favorite words. Power to the people. Thank you. The black and white photos I will show you from now on the double exposure of sky taken near my home in New York City and of images from my research materials and snapshots. Under this sky, are we not Hibakusha? My war experience without knowing war. I have no actual experience of war, but I would like to talk about three experiences that have affected my understanding of war. My understanding of the atomic bombing began when I was 11 and first read Beft again Kenji Nakazawa's autobiographical manga. I witnessed Hiroshima's destruction while struggling to read with eyes clouded by overflowing tears. On the morning of the September 11 attacks, there was a beautiful blue sky, much like the sky in Hiroshima before the bombing. My thoughts flew to the Japanese kamikaze pilot while I watched the suicide bombers in the plane attacking the World Trade Center. I felt a bad premonition while thinking about how the war began with the Pearl Harbor attack. After September 11, American flags appeared instantly in New York. Patriotism spread, and the war on terror began. On March 11, the WHO declared COVID-19 a pandemic, the same day as the Fukushima nuclear accident in 2011. Curfews, social distancing, and use of masks changed the daily life rules so quickly. Ambulance, silence, people lining up for food, and the death toll increasing reminded me of wartime. Fukushima nuclear disaster. In 2015, I visited the Fukushima disaster area for the first time. In the temporary house in Minamisoma where I stayed, I learned about the divided situation between the victims and locals. Because of the canceling the evacuation order, the temporary housing was discontinued and everyone was evicted. Currently, there are preparations for the Olympics next year in Fukushima, despite high levels of radioactivity still being recorded. 
in the surrounding areas of nuclear disaster, tens of millions of flecon bags packed with the contaminated soil have been stored with no plan of action by the government for disposal, except they will no, now, use, now be used in public project. Contaminated water inside the plants has been increasing, and the government is considering discharging it into the sea. Siloed cancer of children has been increasing, and there are numerous other health issues. Japan is the only non-nuclear state to reprocess and separate plutonium and produce it and stores 10 times as much plutonium as China's military use. Many people don't know Japan was developing an atomic bomb during World War II. Under the sky, Manhattan Project, Nash Garage Building represents an early example of the alliance between government, academia, and private industry that characterize the Manhattan Project. It is a minute's walk from the community center that hosted my project, Under the Sky, Manhattan Project. This project uses the history of nuclear bomb to raise awareness of our environment and provide a vein for teens to practice new skills, expand their thinking, and engage in artistic creation. Twelve students create a book about their impression and what they learned, each working on different topics in nuclear issues. Radioactive hotspots are present in New York. The former Wolf Alport Chemical Company on Irving Avenue had a contract with the Manhattan Project and the Atomic Energy Commission. There are no warning signs for high radioactive, radioactive in this residential area. My hometown is about 80 miles from the Fukushima nuclear accident and is a candidate site for the radioactive waste disposal. My father had a surgery to remove the thyroid cancer. Later, we are informed it was a misdiagnosis. However, we learned thyroid cancer is increasing in this area. All things are linked, hot spots. An embossed white world map without borders represents the beginning of Earth. The paper cranes are made from a world map and are located where nuclear plants and uranium mine accidents occurred, where nuclear tests are conducted, and where nuclear weapons are used. Looking at this map, nuclear pollution is spreading all over the world. Are we not Hibakusha? It is time to face radiation as a problem of our own rather than of others. My name is Johnny Bob. I was born here on our treaty land. I was born here to stay here with my people. I live here near Austin, Nevada. Austin, Nevada is where there's a ghost town now, mining town. But it's still in my mind that all the people that used to go over there to be who they are and talk about the console uh, from all the people that came from Elko, Battle Mountain, Wales, and other places out there and talk about our treaty, treaty that's connected with our land. Everything that's connected is the main thing that we always worry about.
at uh, Yucca Mountain. Yucca Mountain is one of the dangerous places on this earth, as we always say, that our government is bringing in a lot of nuclear waste, bombing, testing our shells or testing their bombs and testing their military airplanes and testing other things with explosive. They test the wind, which way the wind is blowing. I don't think they really have any idea that wind changes. Even if it's not windy, that radiation that's in that wind, in that soft, soft moving air, hot air that goes down towards Vegas is infecting Las Vegas too. But we the people always do that prayer for all the people. So we happen to do our prayer around Riaca Mountain by doing a walk and run. We walk and then we run. We camp out every 30 miles and do our prayers with our elders, with our children, the kids that come out to do a lot of running and a lot of walking. We talk about the histories of our life that we, our ancestors did a long time ago. We have problems with the Nevada test site. They won't let us inside, so we'd go around it. And that's what we've been doing since 2000. I have been connected with our spiritual persons that's gone now, have passed away a few years ago, that we will continue with this walk and run. We will continue with this walk and run with our non-natives to show the respect of our treaty, respect of our people, respect of our, all the living things here on this Mother Earth. A treaty was given to us by these people that, that uh, we signed with our government. Peace and friendship, but we haven't heard anything else with our government about our treaty, royalty, the things that they've been doing, destructing our land, raping our land, taking our water, and taking other things that don't belong to them because we haven't given them permission to do any of that. Especially at Yucca Mountain, it's contaminated water. We don't want to go down there. Nobody wants to even do anything down there. So after that's all bombed out and radiationed out, you know, most of our elders have passed on. Our elders that know the area about our medicine, their camping area, their trails, their horses, their deers, the animals that they eat, everything out there now, there's nothing out there. So this is something that, that we have to think about all the time Which and do a lot of prayers. The opinion of starting up nuclear testing at the test site again. Say it again. The opinion of starting up nuclear testing at the test site again. So if this nuclear testing continues and uh, come alive again, come back to where they're going to be doing the shipments again, I see that a lot of hurt feelings from our people, from their heart. And we can when we come out to do our prayers. People have broken hearts. I guess that's where our broken treaties come from with the non-natives, because they don't listen to us. They don't feel that energy. They don't feel nothing. They feel what they see on the ground and they're coming to them from taxpayers' money. And in a broken hearted and a broken treaty, that's how we are standing here with our government. 
They don't listen. They lie to us. They feel like they have done something good, but no, you know, our elders long time ago, you know, they talked about all this with our government that used to come over to us, but very few that listen. But when they come to a writing for their own good, the government always turns things around. So we don't hear anything else until things happen. Things happening the wrong way. Things are happening by taking our water away, taking our belief away, taking our spiritual things away, taking our ways of our, our ceremony grounds by putting big mines in the valley, destroying things, our burial sites taking things and just moving everything out of the way or just move it into another hole where our burial sites are, are now. There's big things that's going on in this world these days for all the people, not just Shoshones, but Shoshones are worried that there's some days that everything's going to be well, turned over. So as a Shoshone way and our native way, we still pray, we're still here. We haven't gone, they haven't dis made us disappear yet. We're still here with our friends and non-natives to keep on praying for this land. So what do the Western Shoshone people want in terms of the test site in the Yucca Mountain? The people want on this Nevada test site to stop the testing, stop bringing the nuclear waste. Whatever is there right now, just keep it there because they don't want to be disturbed. Keep it in a good way with our prayers. Keep it in a good way so no contamination come out of it if they open something up underground by bringing new nuclear waste dump or any kind of trash that comes around. Just keep it safe. No more nuclear testing out there wherever they're doing it. No more nuclear waste coming in the highways because there's cities out there, they have to go transport to all this nuclear waste. They got big shipments coming to different places and making it worse in the other areas too. So we don't, any place where the government is putting this uh, nuclear waste, don't bring it here to Nevada. Don't bring it in to any other places. Keep it in your backyard, deal with it, experiment with it. It's your nuclear waste. So how do we heal your land? To heal our land, to heal our people, to heal all four-legged animals, to heal this Mother Earth, because our children lives on it, our grandpa lives on it, dad lives on it, our grandfather lives on it, our big grandfather lives on it, our grandmother Moon lives on it, our Mother Earth, we're so old that all we can do is pray to heal it, pray to make it understand that we are still here and praying for all the, all the things that's here for our life and the children's and the water. Say your name again and your title and give everybody a short prayer. And uh, now that uh, things are very sacred to all of us, especially to our Shoshone people. And uh, my name is Johnny Bob in the Western Shoshone Nation, a spiritual person. And the people that's around me, the veterans of peace mm -hmm. for, you know, protecting us to continuing on the peace and friendship, the peace to bring us 
good feelings among us so we could go out there and talk with each other to be free to feel free to talk about peace and friendship the natives peace and friendship we have a lot of treaties we haven't broken them treaties we haven't gotten anything from any of the treaties that the government already promised us a long time ago but we have continuing on praying and this is something that everybody should be doing keep burning that fire keep using that big uh, spiritual person to do the ceremonies with all the people and letting them know that we are yat a she a leona morgan yinishia twitch eat me initially then i'm busy but she's team kia ani da she che toho glini da shanela hello my name is leona morgan and i want to say thank you to the organizers for inviting me to be here with you all on this day i am very honored to be a part of the veterans for peace 2020 National Convention. Today I will be talking about the impacts from nuclear colonialism, specifically impacts from uranium mining on my people and our traditional homelands. I am Diné, and we are indigenous to Diné Bikea, which is within our four sacred mountains located in the southwest region of what is currently called the United States. As my presentation focuses on my people and our relatives of Turtle Island, the legacy and ongoing struggles of uranium mining are not unique to us, as uranium mining occurs at least 70% of the time on indigenous territories worldwide. I have heard the same stories of poor worker conditions, contamination, sickness and death, and concerns for our sacred places from indigenous peoples worldwide, specifically in Australia, Saskatchewan, Mongolia, and even the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where the very highly concentrated uranium ore was taken out of our Mother Earth and brought to the United States for the Manhattan Project and eventually ended up in Japan. As we gather together this week, please keep in mind the people who worked at and live around the Shinkalobwe uranium mine as their story is not well known. And now they are dealing with a push to reopen that mine as well as restarting an old nuclear reactor. As I begin my presentation, I'd like to start with this picture of Monument Valley. As you can see, it is quite beautiful. You can see the iconic rock formations in the foreground and the moon rising in the background, as well as the stars above. What you cannot see is the radioactive contamination that was left from past uranium mining. What is nuclear colonialism? Nuclear colonialism is the, nuclear colonialism is the systematic disposition of indigenous lands, exploitation of cultural resources, and the subjugation and oppression of indigenous peoples to further nuclear production of energy and proliferation of weapons from uranium mining, uranium processing, weapons testing, and waste storage, resulting in the genocide of indigenous peoples, destruction of indigenous cultures, and creation of national sacrifice zones. For example, in this world map of where weapons, where nuclear weapons were used and tested, it shows Japan right here, and this biggest mushroom cloud here represents the Nevada tests that were on Western Shoshone lands. Some of the Western Shoshone call themselves the most bombed nation on the planet. This infographic depicts the nuclear fuel chain, illustrating the path from uranium develop development into nuclear fuel for power plants. Here at the enrichment stage, depending on how much uranium is enriched, it could take a different route to become nuclear weapons. Notice at each stage of the nuclear fuel chain, waste is created. The most toxic being the high level radioactive waste at the back end. And we have about 80,000 metric tons of this stuff created at nuclear power plants with nowhere to go. Right now in Congress and internationally, there's a push for new nuclear ener energy development as a way to curb climate change. The proponents of nuclear energy claim it is low carbon because they only count the carbon footprint of the nuclear power plant and they discount the entire front and back ends as well as the transport 
and the storage of the used fuel rods that will be radioactive for millions of years. We all know that nuclear energy is not green, it's not clean, and it's not renewable. Even if you reprocess it, you end up with more waste. It is not a solution to climate change and actually makes it worse, taking away valuable resources from developing true renewables and sustainable energies. Just like new and increased weapons development, the push for nuclear energy means a push for more uranium mining. So all the places where uranium has been mined will always be threatened as long as US imperialism exists and as long as the nuclear lobby keeps pushing for more nuclear energy. Here are, the, here are the places where the major uranium deposits exist in the world, with the most being in Australia, Kazakhstan, and Canada. In the United States, uranium is mostly located in the Western region. There was a uranium boom that started in the 1950s and lasted until about the late 70s, which was mostly used for weapons production. And this occurred before there were laws in place for the protection of our environment and human health. The National Environmental Policy Act wasn't even passed until 1970, the same year the EPA was created, whereas the Atomic Energy Commission started in 1946. So the uranium that was mined during that time was not regulated and companies came in, they took out the uranium and left us with radioactive contamination and lasting health impacts. How did this happen? Well, here's a list of the tools of colonization and nuclear colonialism, and it all started with the doctrine of discovery. That early mining was predominantly for weapons and later came nuclear power plants, leaving us with an estimated 15,000 abandoned uranium mines across the country. EPA counts 15,000, but the DOE only counts about 4,000. To date, there is no law in place to enforce or fund the cleanup of all these AUMs in the United States. But there is some cleanup happening on the Navajo Nation. This map shows the identified 523 abandoned uranium mines on Navajo. Five federal agencies have been working with the Navajo EPA and other entities in these five-year plans starting back in 2008, decades after the uranium boom. Meanwhile, contamination has already spread and some has even gone back into the earth. While the health impacts are still not fully studied and people continue to suffer from various illnesses and death caused by exposure to radiation and heavy metals toxicity. Here are some pictures of areas that were mined on Navajo and you can see how the contamination was transported by environmental factors and spread throughout the community. The picture on the left is of the Church Rock area, and on the right is Monument Valley. Here are some other pictures of areas where uranium production is still impacting indigenous communities today. In South Dakota, this pile of mill tailings sits just a few hundred yards away from this school. In Powati, New Mexico, the world's largest open pit uranium mine operated and lasted for a short time, but the radioactive waste lasts forever. The mining caused many problems in the community from the blasting and later the radioactive dust still blows into people's homes, which is of great concern today. Naturally, uranium is mostly immobile and doesn't really go anywhere unless it's disturbed and, it, and then it easily moves throughout the environment and can get into our food and water resources. When animals eat contaminated plants, and then we eat the animals, it can also get into us. Of course, the decay products are also a huge concern, especially radon gas. One of the most impacted areas is about 12 miles north of Church Rock. We say Church Rock, that's where this little goat was born, and I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. Well, it's not actually Church Rock, but it's the Redwater Pond Road community. As you can see from this aerial view, there are houses in between two uranium mines, right here and right here, and less than half a mile from a uranium mill, where the largest uranium spill in the world occurred on July 16, 1979, about 5.30 in the morning, the same day and time as the Trinity test, which took place in southern New Mexico in 1945. 
the Church Rock spill released more than 90 million gallons of liquid radioactive waste and over 1,100 tons of solid radioactive waste that flowed at least 100 miles westward into Arizona. It is not widely known and was largely covered up by local officials and erased by mainstream media, which focused more on Three Mile Island that happened only three months prior. It's important for us to recognize the Church Rock spill and Trinity test on par with other nuclear disasters, such as Hiroshima, Nagasaki, Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and Fukushima, as well as the weapons testing and experimentation that occurred on the Marshall, the Marshall Islands people and in Western Shoshone. To this day, the extent of that spill path has not been fully studied or cleaned up. However, there has been some remediation at the mines and at the mill site and in the Redwater Pond Road community. Here are some pictures of what cleanup looks like. Notice Bertha Nez here with her before and after pictures of the cleanup. The government scraped up several layers of topsoil, and so this hill that was once covered by trees is now bare and has not fully been recovered. The Redwater Pond Road Community Association is asking the government agencies to move them away to their, to their other seasonal home further north. As indigenous peoples, we don't usually leave our traditional family home sites, yet these folks are asking for the government to pay for them to move as they are told and they are told it is too expensive to extend roads and power lines to the place where they plan to build new homes. Edith Hood, one of my personal heroes, says directly to the government, be it the Navajo Nation or the federal, that she thinks they are just waiting for her to die. She is also the coordinator of the Redwater Pond Road Community Association that started to do these annual commemoration events starting with the 30th anniversary in 2009. They do these events on July 16th to create awareness about the 1979 spill and ongoing and current issues. Here is Larry King retelling the story about the morning of the spill as he drove to work. He noticed there was water in the Puerco River and yet it hadn't been raining in that region for, for days and he wondered where did, that, where did that water come from? When he got to the mill where he worked, he learned what happened. Even though the mining was decades ago, the impacts are still felt and can be seen here in these photos date stamped 2006, when this little goat was born without any mohair and died within 30 minutes. Because Exposure to radiation can severely impact human health and you can't sense it with just your body alone. I helped to co-found the Radiation Monitoring Project with two of my best friends to help educate and provide Geiger counters to impacted community folks. We started fundraising in 2014 and bought nearly 30 radiation monitors and by 2018 completed 10 trainings, each customized to the needs of the communities that were being trained. We also created culturally appropriate educational materials showing the impacts to the most vulnerable. This is the kind of stuff I needed when I was dealing with the ISL mine that I was involved in fighting from 2007 to 2014, but that didn't exist. So we worked with some experts who helped to explain the different impacts from uranium, both from exposure to, uran to radiation and heavy metal toxicity. Yuko Tonohira, a very talented artist, did all these cool graphics that are available on our website. Going back to the impacts to indigenous peoples, another initiative I helped to get started was Hall No. Hall No is an indigenous-led fight against uranium mining, uranium transport, and uranium milling. We did lots of outreach connecting the issues of Canyon Mine near the Grand Canyon and Red Butte, which is a sacred site to the Havasupai, the, the White Mesa Uranium Mill in the Ute Mountain Ute community in southeastern Utah, and the transport through indigenous communities, including Havasupai, Wallapai, Navajo, Hopi, and Ute, which are all represented in this photo with folks from those nations, as well as some other New Mexico Pueblo indigenous people and relatives from the south. 
In order for us to succeed in our fights, we must all work together and support each other across all cultures and all stages of the nuclear fuel chain and across the world. Indigenous peoples have been doing this for generations, connecting the uranium mining and waste fights to both the nuclear energy and weapons fights. The reasons we do this work are not just for us, but also to protect our cultures for future generations. We must protect the sacred and speak up for all life. As I mentioned at the beginning, there is this huge problem of high level radioactive waste from power plants. The United States government has allowed private industry to make this waste even though there is no permanent place to store it. The idea was to put it at Yucca Mountain, again impacting the Western Shoshone. However, this area is not suitable and the Western Shoshone and state of Nevada fought it. Now, the idea is to store it temporarily at consolidated interim storage sites or CIS sites until a permanent facility is built. There are two proposals by different, two different private, there are two proposals by different private companies in New Mexico and Texas. This means the waste could be transported twice, first to the Southwest and then to a future permanent location that has not been built or even designed yet. This waste is so dangerous, it should not be moved at all. There's a national coalition of folks working together to fight this, and you can contact me to get involved. As you can see, most of the nuclear power plants are in the east, and everyone in between these reactors and the CIS sites are at risk if these proposals are passed, and we must stop it. We advocate for keeping the waste where it is and where it was generated or as close as possible until a scientifically sound and environmentally just location is identified. And just to show the overlapping areas of where uranium deposits and nuclear power plants are, you can see how the uranium was extracted from our lands and taken somewhere else to make bombs or electricity. And now the nuclear industry and federal government are trying to bring it back, some of it in the form of this forever deadly waste. Just to reiterate, because some nuclear power plants create the key ingredients for weapons, you cannot separate the two. And we need to connect our fights against both nuclear weapons and nuclear energy. And one way, one way to stop both is to stop uranium mining. Well, that's my presentation. And just one more last announcement from friends in Japan about an online petition to stop the Japanese government and TEPCO from releasing radioactive wastewater from Fukushima into the Pacific is, it, it can be found here on this website well, this is a, a link to that website. If you go to tinyurl.com backslash no Fukushima water in Pacific, in Pacific Ocean, it'll lead you to that, to the information and the petition. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for this opportunity to speak with you today about how the nuclear industry occupies New Mexico and how it plans to continue to occupy New Mexico. So to begin, I'd like to acknowledge this beautiful, wonderful, enchanted place of the Tewa, Tiwa, and Towa peoples. Thank you. The nuclear industry first began to occupy New Mexico in the late 1930s, early 1940s, when they began looking for uranium. And now they have plans to stay here forever. My presentation will talk about this cycle of the nuclear industry, and then I'll talk about how you can get involved and help us. And the overview is that New Mexico is known as a land of enchantment. It's the fifth largest state in the union after Alaska, Texas, California and Montana. We have 2.1 million people, which results in a density of about 17 people per square mile. The New Mexico state budget for this fiscal year that just started June 30th is about $7.6 billion. And it's um, 
we've gone through a budget crisis as a result of the oil and gas industry uh, shutdowns and the budget is being adjusted but for years the state budget and the Department of Energy budget has have been the same uh, DOE Department of Energy plans to spend about 7.6 billion dollars in New Mexico in the fiscal year that begins in October 1st so we have this parity in the state that is very important to understand. I want to thank Deborah Reed for this beautiful map about the threats. It's on our website at nuclearactive.org. But for a simpler version, we're going to look at the Nuclear Watch New Mexico map. The nuclear industry began looking for uranium in the late 1930s, early 1940s. And they went to the Grant's Uranium Belt here in the northwest part of the state. They created the world's largest open pit uranium mine, the Jack Pyle Mine. In the spring of 1943, the U.S. Army removed homesteaders on the Pajarito Plateau here to, uh, for the Manhattan Engineering District to create Project Y which was to uh, design and build atomic weapons and to test the first uh, plutonium-based bomb, the Gadget, on July 16, 1945, here at the Trinity site. Later, three weeks later, the uranium bomb that was designed and built at Los Alamos National Laboratory, or the Project Y, was dropped August 6th on Hiroshima, Japan. On August 9th, um, the bomb mo with modifications that was dropped on the Trinity site um, was dropped on Nagasaki, Japan. So. Los Alamos National Lab is 25 miles northwest of Santa Fe. Oh, here. Just to give you some perspective. Um, the Department of Energy plans to expand plutonium pit production. And again, the pits are the triggers for the nuclear weapons. They're a great fruit sized ball of plutonium surrounded by high explosives. DOE plans to spend $6.4 billion over the next five years, and that estimate is double what they said three years ago. The, um, the Department of Energy wants to build 30 pits per year at Los Alamos and 50 pits per year at the Savannah River site near um, in South Carolina on the Savannah River. So in the late 1970s, um, the Department of Energy and its predecessors, the predecessors, the Atomic Energy Commission, the um, ERTA Energy Research and Development Department, needed a place to put the plutonium contaminated waste because plutonium is very dangerous if you inhale it or ingest it because a millionth of a gram can cause cancer. So this waste needs to be isolated from the environment, not only for security issues, but also um, because of the human health impacts. So they went, the uh, boosters in southeastern New Mexico said, come and put the waste in the salt beds 2,150 feet below the surface of the earth at the waste isolation pilot plant. So they began construction in the early 1980s. They promised the state of New Mexico that they would only operate for 25 years. WIP opened in 1999. It's supposed to close in 2024. The Department of Energy said that they wanted to keep WIP open until 2050, then 2080, and now they say they don't want a closure date. So that's all to facilitate expanded pit production at Los Alamos National Laboratory 
and the Savannah River site. So New Mexico ratepayer, and we need your help with that. We need your help to oppose pit production at both the Savannah River site and at Los Alamos. New Mexico ratepayers have been um, paying fees for the Palo Verde nuclear power plant in Arizona for decades. And now there's two proposals to bring all of the commercial nuclear power plant waste, the spent fuel rods, the waste, to New Mexico and West Texas. The first proposal is called is by Holtec International for a site called the Holtec site. It's 16 miles north of WIP. The second site is here at the Interim Storage Partners or WCS proposed interim storage site for high level waste from the nuclear power plants. And the WCS ISP site is five miles east of Eunice, New Mexico. Comments, public comments on the environmental impact statements for both facilities are this fall, begin this fall. So for Holtec it's September 22nd and for the WCS ISP comments are due November 3rd. There's a lot of places where you can find draft comments to submit. You have Beyond Nuclear, Nuclear Information and Resource Center, um, the Seeds Coalition in Texas, Sierra Club. Um, please get involved and help us oppose um, these, these proposals. So other things that you can do is you can sign up for, on the CCNS website at nuclearactive.org to receive our weekly CCNS news update along with uh, do you know, did you know about comment periods and other activities, webinars that you can view. And we produce a, a broadcast that's on our local NPR station, which we've been doing for 32 years. And you can listen to that as well as read it. So I want to thank um, everyone, and especially Ken Mayers, for filming this today. Um, for this opportunity to talk to you about how the nuclear industry um, occupies New Mexico and plans to continue to occupy New Mexico forever. And thank you for your help to help us oppose